Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if you need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Thank you, Tim. Exciting things happening, so lots of good things that are going on this week, and uh, we have uh, Joshua and Joel who are coming in this week. Joshua will be here on Wednesday, and so he's going to be getting here finally. It's been a long process. Joel comes on Thursday, so if you're feeling strong and want to unload trucks, let us know. Uh, That's a good thing that's going to be going on. So, a few things like that are happening. Can I get a little bit more on this? We've got a new sound system, so if I sound like I'm yelling at you, it's perfect. (laughs) So, if I can get uh, not have to scream up here and you get the scream out there, well then I think we're just about right, so I think that'll be good. Okay, Um, new quarter starting next week as well. Uh, Not this Wednesday, so make sure you understand that. Wednesday we'll still have the the last class of of the ones we have been doing, but new quarter starts next week. A lot of it's going to continue with the Believe series, and so in here that's what's going to continue, but uh, Ken will be here next week. And then Joshua is going to be, I mean, might as well get him started to work, right? Don't let him sit around, so he's going to be teaching the class in here, and he or Jimmy is going to be finishing up on that, so you might have several teachers there. Uh, Ashby is going to do archaeology. He's been doing this in uh, room 104, and so on Sunday mornings, uh, if you're interested in that, Ashby will be doing that part. Uh, Also, we have Steve Hubbard, who is going to be teaching his Science of Genesis class, and he's going to be in room 105. And so if you ever want to know more about what that is, about how science fits with the Bible, and we have a lot of things today that are very contradictory to that. The whole theory of evolution and irresponsibility then seems to come into play there. And so Steve can explain to you exactly why the Bible is a better system, why the Bible is true, and why that all works, and he knows where the dinosaurs went. So if you have any questions about dinosaurs, about fossils, about all the beginnings, about flood, about all of that stuff, Steve does a tremendous job in being able to to teach that class. And so go in there and listen to him. Wilburn is going to be doing Making Disciples in the Library. And so if you're interested in evangelism and interested in making disciples, then, then talk to Wilburn. He'd be good. Uh, This won't be this Wednesday, but coming up, Nancy is going to be teaching a class on the evidence of a transformed life, and so that will be coming up the next week, and Chuck Watts is going to be teaching that which fills the heart, and so it looks like we've got a lot of good things that are going to be happening here, and so I'm excited about all of these things. New guys coming, new classes starting. You might notice a few changes around the building. Uh, We're still working on some of those things, so we're not finished with all of that stuff yet. But all of that says there's a hope. There's something else better. We're working towards something that is going to be a better model, a better way to do things. And so 
Hopefully that gives you this idea of what hope's really all about. Uh, we want to start in 1 Peter, because here he talks about exactly the things we're going to have. So we're really starting at the end, because this is to me what we are able to have as this hope is realized. He says, we've been born again to this living hope. How do you get living hope? Well, it's, it's kind of the halfway in between. We have the hope, but it's not quite realized yet. You know, it's not completely done yet. And so there's this living hope that we're able to have. It's different than a wish. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's because we have this living hope. We have this inheritance that is imperishable, undefined. It's not fading away. It's going to be here forever. And this hope is something that we have as some very, very secure. We have this inheritance in heaven. It's going to be revealed. And because of all those things, because of this great promise that he's been giving, he says, this is better than gold. When you have a person whose faith has been tested, you can be more secure about that than you can the gold standard. Better than the stock market, right? Because we know how that one goes. Better than some of the other things that we want to depend on. He says, if you have a person whose faith has been tested, what an incredible thing it is. Gold just melts away. Faith doesn't. It's going to stay. And so we are able to rejoice and have praise and glory and honor at the revealing of Jesus because we have this faith. And even though we haven't seen him, we understand, we know, and we rejoice. And that's what our worship is all about. We start rejoicing now because this hope is already realized. We know that it's going to happen. And since we know that it's going to happen, we are able to be filled with glory. And that's what makes Christian worship so good is because we know positively how all of this comes out. But I don't think the world knows that yet. They're kind of unsure about things, and so maybe an unsure hope. Uh, I always have to go back to the old Bill Cosby line as the guy steps onto the plane. Hope the plane don't crash. He said, everybody else is mad at you because they didn't think to say it first. You know, that's just the way it goes. I mean, isn't that the first hope? Well, that's not much of a hope, is it? You know, hope something negative doesn't happen. And if that's all the hope you've got, that's really not much. You know, that's the hope we don't have a car wreck on the way home. Hope we don't have a flat tire when you get to the parking lot. I hope nobody runs into me. I hope that's a pretty depressing kind of hope. And if that's all you've got, then, then that's really kind of sad because that isn't what Jesus came to give us is let's hope there's no disasters now. There might be a few. And he even says, we're going to be tested by various trials. And so be ready for that, because hope goes through that. Hope endures that. Hope gets us past all of those things. And so as we look at that and realize what that's all about, I think that's what he's trying to say. Then there's the hope that we're going to win, Right? There's this hope that we can win something, that something's going to be good, that there's going to be this blessing, that everything's going to be great. That's why we play the lottery. Well, I don't, but that's why people would play the lottery, right? I mean, because I have this hope that if I buy this ticket for, what is it, two bucks, one buck? How much do you have to spend? Okay, $2 on this one. How much do you get back? <laughs> Nothing, absolutely. <laughs> you bought the ticket and you scratched it off or you waited for the numbers to come out and, okay, that was fun. I, I never have understood that part. Uh, but anyway, some people like to play that because they have this hope that something great's going to happen. But you ought to know what the odds are, I guess, on this kind of a hope. But Because he says, chances of you dying on the way to get your lottery ticket is greater than the chance of you actually winning the lottery. And so that's why I don't do this. But that's what happens to us sometimes is we have this hope and it's completely unrealistic. 
I'm amazed at how many people would put their trust in, oh man, when I win the lottery, this is... So what if you bought 1,000 tickets a week? You lose $2,000 a week. That's what happens when you buy 1,000 tickets a week. I've known a few people who have actually won. They were okay, nice people still. Caused a lot of aggravation in their families. Because as soon as you win, you have lots of cousins. <laughs> I don't know how you got so many cousins, but boy, they seem to come out from everywhere. So that kind of hope is, is maybe not such a good hope because you're hoping in something that seems impossible. It isn't really going to happen. You can hope for a birthday present or hope for something to happen. And so that's not as bad as the first one, but it doesn't have any real basis either because we haven't put anything into it. It's just about luck. We didn't invest anything. We didn't do anything to get it. And so $2 is not really called an investment. I think there's a false hope that is simply in something else. Sometimes we don't want to have our illusion destroyed, and so we're going to hope in something else. We're going to hope that this job will come, that everything will be great, that I will be rich off of it, because after all, if I had enough money, I would be happy. We hope to win the lottery because then we will be happy. How do you buy happy? With enough money, I would be happy, right? With enough money, it would solve all the problems. Mm, that really hasn't shown to be true. With enough money, some problems would be solved and others would be created. And so that's kind of the way that whole process works. So as you look at this, sometimes we want to say, well, money is going to make happiness, well, money is going to make friends, money is going to make joy, and it doesn't work that way. Or we decide, you know what, I'll get married. And my wife will make me happy. She will do everything I want her to do. She will clean the house, she will cook all the meals, she will do everything I want her to do. And you guys are just out of luck, because I got the last one that actually does all of that. So. <laughs> but we put our hope in somebody else. That person will make me happy. I'll just have a friend that will make me happy. It really doesn't matter who it is. We find out before too long, they can't make us happy in everything. Because for some reason, they think we ought to give something back. We ought to put something into this. That wasn't why we were doing it. We thought they would do that. And that's what happens. Another person can do that. So we get married in order to be happy because if we were married, that person would have to do all those things for us. Or we even have a baby because if we just had a baby, a baby would make us a better couple and make us happier. And then we decide, well, you know, if I just didn't have to put up with you, then I would be a lot happier. And we decide as soon as we can get away from each other, we'll be. None of those things are really going to be true. Because that's an illusion, and they're all outside of us. And if it's outside of us, it's really not going to create the happiness that we're looking for. It's not going to give us hope. I hope in someone else will be my answer. I hope money will be my answer. I hope my new job will be my answer. I hope my new friend will be my answer. Or my kids or, or whatever it is. It has to come from the inside. Sometimes we'll move closer to somebody just because that will make life happier. If I get a new one, I'll be happier. And all of those things have one thing in common. It's something else making me happy. Has nothing to do with my faith, has nothing to do with my commitment, or anything like that. But what I want to tell you today is that true hope is about your commitment. True hope is about your faith and what I believe enough to call my hope.
because I believe in it so much that I can see that it's going to come through. It will change everything. And I'm willing to be committed enough to work at it so that it will change everything. And I can believe in this regardless of everyone else, regardless of any other circumstance. What kind of hope can we see with that? Hope sees the invisible, feels the intangible, and achieves the impossible. Because when you have that kind of hope, that's what makes all the difference for us. A lot of times our hope is just way too small. Because what happens is it's, well, I hope I get to heaven. Well, isn't that good? It's more like a wish. Hope I win the lottery, hope I get to heaven. I have no investment in it. I have no commitment to it. I have nothing to suggest that it would even remotely possibly be true. It's just a hope I get to heaven. Hope I get a million dollars. Hope I win the lottery. What kind of hope is that? Not much. Or we'll do it the other way. You know, I'll join the church. The church will get me to heaven. It's the same thing. A person can't do it. A church can't do it. Yeah, yeah. If I'm a member of the church, then members go to heaven, right? Isn't that why you'd be a member? If, you know, if, what's the point if you aren't guaranteed heaven? And we'll actually have some people who will call here and go, I'm a member of your church. And I'm going, really? What's your name again? Well, I haven't been there in over 20 years, but, you know, I'm a member. Okay, just a clue. If you don't show up for several years, you're going to be taken off. <laughs> because that's not a member. Unless you're involved in, in here and worshiping and things like that, well, at least a phone call, something. But if you have zero involvement and zero commitment and no way in which you make any connection at all, that doesn't say member. But we think sometimes just because our name is on the roll, which is now a computer, you understand, that means heaven. You can have heaven, by the way. But the church can't give it to you. The church is the collection of people who believe enough and have hope enough that they will be there. And when we accept that and understand that, then we are able to have that hope of heaven. We are able to make that real. Because church is not the thing that takes you to heaven. Jesus is the one who takes you to heaven. And we need to understand that first of all. The church is full of sinners. That's usually what it is. Hopefully, they are forgiven sinners, but they are just a bunch of sinners. So let me show you how all this process happens. In Romans 3.23, there's a very, first, a very short statement that just doesn't sound very hopeful. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay. By all you mean, Yes. By all, I mean you. By all, I mean me. We have all sinned, and we fall short of the glory of God. We don't have a place. We don't have a way. We don't have a chance of being able to be with God. Everyone sins, especially me. Things that are not godly seem to come out of our mouth. I don't know how that happens. We think thoughts that are not godly. We do things that we're going, who did that? I wonder why. Why did I do that? I, I certainly wouldn't be thinking and do that. We get angry. We want revenge. We jump on other people with our mistakes. And it just seems like we make a mess out of things. But the worst part of that whole phrase is we fell short of God's glory. That's where we were headed. That's where we were intended. And we fell short of his glory. We could have shared his glory. But because we sinned. And I guess we could go blame Adam for this. As you look at Romans and look at what it talks about in chapter 5, he's going to talk about Adam and about how you know sin came into the world through Adam. It's all Adam's fault, but that isn't what this says. This says, for 
all have sinned. And the reason you're having a struggle with getting to heaven is not because of Adam. It's really because of your sin. And because of the things that you've committed, because of the things that you've done. We all have things that happen. We all make mistakes. Sometimes we've traded the knowledge of good and evil for the glory of God. And we ended up with just a knowledge of evil. It doesn't matter what it is. Everything can let us down. You ever had a flat tire? You ever lost a battery? I mean, this is Arizona. Sometimes things go bad. And so what do you do? Well, I'm going to buy a new truck. Right? The other one's broke. Might as well get a new truck. What an ironic picture. I mean, it's just crazy. But it... As you look at the whole thing, you start saying, well, you know, why would I fix the old one? I mean, that means a jack and having to get it out and having to pump it up and get a different tire and putting it on. And I might as well just get a new one. And we think that way sometimes. You ever gotten tired of where your car is? Yeah, there's too many things with it. Let's just get a new one. My house, too many things going wrong with it. Let's just get a new one. We'll move. Because what I'd really like is a different set of problems. You know, that's what happens. My spouse isn't doing what they're supposed to. I'll just get a new one. It's harder to do that with kids. They tend to follow you around. I'll just get new ones. And no, that doesn't work out at all. Because they're the reflection of how you did it. So it's really kind of on you for that one. But we can't just get a new one. And I'm so glad God doesn't say, you know what, you people have sinned. I'm just going to get new ones. He does say that sometimes. But fortunately, Moses was able to say, God, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that because you brought these people out here. And God says, all right, then we'll try and fix it. And if we're going to try and fix it, that's really where our hope comes into play. Because we're going to try and fix it. We can't afford a new one. We can't afford a new truck. We can't afford a new life. We can't afford our sins. The wages of sin is death. We cannot afford that. And God doesn't say he's going to get a new one. He says he's going to give us his son. Because the verse around that one that we just read, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to receive, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because of his divine forbearance. He has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And so, yes, he says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we have been justified by his grace. We have that as our hope. God has sent him to be the sacrifice for our sin, that his blood is able to be the propitiation. In other words, that sacrifice that appeases the angry God who says, okay, because of this I will now forgive Jesus is that sacrifice. Jesus takes that place. And we receive by faith the fact that Jesus is able to do this for us. God does it, but it's only if we believe that it becomes our hope. That we understand and know that God is acting in this. And that Jesus, because he is able to go to that cross, because he dies there, because God does this, it's the love of God that is being given to us. And then it shows God's righteousness. So my hope is in the Lord. And only those who believe in this hope are going to find it. It's not just saying, well, it's a nice fact. But those who have believed in this hope, we believe Jesus died on the cross. Not just for everybody's sins, but also for mine. We believe Jesus will come again. We believe God will forgive. We believe he will take us to glory with him. 
we believe and we put our hope in it, we live in it and we plan it and we raise our kids with it and we do our job with it because we act like that is the one thing that is true and that is the one thing we can be sure of. Every other person and money and stock and possession will get old and will let us down because they are not permanent. But the one place where our hope really proves true is in God because that's what makes all the difference for us and that's what changes our life. And so in Romans 5, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope, and that hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. What an incredible passage. Isn't that so great? We have been justified by faith because we believe what God said. It's not just an accident. We absolutely believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin and he took my sin away. I know how bad it was. We can't quite forget it. But he took it all away so that now I don't have it anymore. We've obtained access to grace and grace has washed over us so that now we stand before God completely justified, completely clear, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You realize the difference in the statements? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. They're exactly the same thing. Sin makes us fall short of his glory. Our faith in Jesus Christ gives us that hope that says now we have access to this glory of God. We hope in the glory of God because we know it's going to be there. We're absolutely sure of that. He says not only that, but we even look at suffering differently. We don't see things that come along in our life the same way because we have this hope in Jesus Christ. Because it isn't just about living here. It isn't just about quality of life here. I think it's going to be about quality of life there. Quality of life somewhere else. And so if we run into difficulties here, we are still going to have hope there. Because Jesus is able to heal here. Jesus is able to do great things here. But even if it doesn't happen that way, and rest assured those things are going to come, he says you can use it. You can use it. Because suffering produces endurance. But I don't like to endure. I know. That's why if you do it long enough, it produces it. Because none of us would choose it. And if you endure long enough, it produces character. And character produces hope. His character is able to believe in something much bigger than himself, believe in something much bigger than money, believe in something much bigger than just friends, and believe in something that is so big that God is able to save us. God is able to do so much. It's more secure than the stock market or any other friend. It's good enough to face suffering and say, you know, while I am going through this, that's not the point. I have hope. I will reach the other side, and I know it will be possible. I know God will bless. I know I will be better off having gone through this. Did you ever look at a suffering and say, thank you? That's essentially what he's saying here. Because I have so much hope in God that I understand and I know that this is what's going to happen. That it will produce in me something that I couldn't have gotten before. And so that's what suffering is all about. We see it with some of the people in the Bible. It's how Daniel goes to a lion's den. And he says, you know, I will not lose my hope in God. You can throw me in a lion's den and I may 
you know, be eaten by lions, but I will not lose my hope in God. And sure enough, he doesn't even get licked, I don't think. Then you've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They get thrown into the fiery furnace, and they say the same thing. We will not bow to anyone else but God, because that's where our hope is. And even in spite of the trials and the troubles and the things that are going to come, what a tremendous way he talks about this kind of hope, because that's what gives confidence. Isn't that what we talked about? They believed in an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for us. It causes men to build arcs and move families and go through suffering that is incredible because they had hope in the glory that God would bring. And we talk about them as heroes. Why would we talk about people who suffered as heroes? Because their hope was realized in God. Their hope produced character. Jesus went to a cross based on the hope that was not yet seen. And his hope was that you would believe and respond in faith by being baptized so that you can receive his glory. He had that hope for you. Is it going to be true? But it just adds one more hypocrite to the church, right? One more forgiven hypocrite. Because all of us are going to struggle with that. And all the time people can say things, but I've been forgiven, I've been saved, I've been redeemed, I've been justified, and I'll take that kind of hope. Everybody else can talk about all the things that are going wrong in our lives, and sure, But we have been born again to a living hope by the blood of Jesus Christ that will not perish, that will not fade away, that cannot be defiled. It is a faith that is better than gold because it has been tested by fire and people are able to know we will not break. No matter what. How do we get that? Well, you have to believe it first. Understand what Jesus did for us. Believe it and be baptized into his death and receive his blood so that now our sins are completely washed away and we are able to have this hope in the glory of God. And you can start rejoicing anytime you want. We should do that. Man, we should have planned a song. Have you got a song? A couple, all right. Well, let's stand and sing about this great hope we have in Jesus Christ. (laughs) 